Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 389 of the Old Offense Podcast for this Wednesday, October 23rd, 2024. Perk, the Perk Man, is joining me again today as we talk most things to a, not all to a, but it's going to be an awful lot of to a because today was his first day back at practice. Yep. And I'm guessing in that light, we're probably not going to get pissed off Perk. Am I right? No, no, no. You're going to get happy Perk. Uh, upbeat, Perk, optimistic. Perky Perk. Perky Perk. That's, that's it. Perky Perk. There we go. There we go. Everything's good. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, everything is good in the sense that, Again, as we mentioned, or as I mentioned, Tua Tango Bailo was back at practice on Wednesday. And if you think, obviously, it's a good day for the Dolphins. It's a good day for us in general because team is a little bit more interesting now that the Dolphins actually have a quarterback on their roster who's maybe more than practice squad caliber. Uh, nobody, however, though, was anywhere near as excited as Tyreek Hill. Yeah, yeah. Like, Damn. Um, yeah. There will be stories written. I mean, probably every paper is going to write about it. Miami Dolphins on that side is going to have a story about the excitement level. Week. This is where I'm going to step in and be party pooper or party poopar, however you want to say it. <laughs> that like Tyreek, Tyreek is the what's what is the hype king. Yes. So Tyreek is talking like. If you listen to Tyreek, the Dolphins are winning 52-7 to seven on Sunday, and he has 300 yards receiving and two passes for 500. That's yeah. Such. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know what? And, Poop, here's – I'm going to join you for a second. I, I've, I've tried to warn people – right. <laughs> I'm coming over. I'm coming over to your side for a second. I've tried to warn people that, look, when the last time that we saw Tua – it was too deep zone, and these guys were not proficient at getting the ball to Tyreek and Jalen Waddle. And that in Tua's last eight games, the Dolphins are three and five. He's got eight touchdowns, eight interceptions, and they're averaging 18.4 points per game. So that's the backdrop. Let's have some perspective. Now, it is great that Tua is back. You know, happy days are here again, and this offense is going to average more than 11.7 points per game or whatever they're averaging. Um, that's a guarantee. I, I don't know that we're going to immediately go back to the days of 41, 34. You know, I, I, I just bad don't. Teams. Sorry, that, against bad teams. Against bad teams. And, and this is a bad Arizona team, but. It's they they can play two deep zone just like anybody else, and and that's the thing with the you know with the uh, high scoring expectations. Let's temper that and remember what we saw last time Tua was on the field. Yeah, and uh, correct, and, and I pointed that out to, again to just make people understand if you if you follow the Dolphins, if you follow the Dolphins podcast, you probably know right now is again Ty Tyreek is a hype king. He's a troll. <laughs> He is going to say some wild stuff all over the place. Right. And uh, he was at it again today. But clearly, there is reason for the Dolphins to be excited, optimistic, because their offense, at the absolute least, is not going to be functional with the potential of being very good. Um, yep. Yep. And as I, as I mentioned before, the, the big reason is because they now have a good NFL quarterback as opposed to the practice squad caliber guys that they have. Speaking of which... The Dolphins, because they don't have enough of those types of quarterbacks, decided to add one more. They signed C.J. Beathard to the practice squad, former San Francisco 49ers with Mike McDaniel, former Jacksonville Jaguars, got uh, 32 NFL games. I believe it's 13 starts. Yep. Career record as a starter is 3-10. and 10, Yeah. Which is not particularly impressive. Better than Tim Boyle's 0-5, but yeah. still not particularly impressive. And – uh, and McDaniel, obviously, and I, when he was asked about what he liked about him, uh, and then basically he mentioned he, he former third round pick of the 49ers in 2017, which was Mike McDaniel's first year there after he came over from Atlanta. The fact that he's tough and all that, and he's resilient. Those are great. I mean, those are great qualities for human beings. Right. <laughs> for a quarterback, mm -hmm, I prefer. Prefer good decision making, accuracy, pocket presence, but hey, that's just me. I'm I'm weird that way. Um, <laughs> so, so now you have five quarterbacks on the roster, and it's Tua, 
Tyler Huntley, Tim Boyle, Skylar Thompson, and C.J. Beathard. So the problem of having a competent number two still remains. Yep, yep, yep. And and look, um, I, I, I can appreciate them going out and getting C.J. Beathard and McDaniel saying that he called Beathard uh, after his release from Jacksonville and blah, blah, blah. But, Poop, we know if you're available at this time of year, regardless of position – you've probably got some deficiencies to your game. You're, you're not very good and or you've got an injury history. That's pretty much all that's available at this time of year. And so that's what C.J. Beathard is and that's what Snoop Huntley was and that's what Tim Boyle was. And that's all you're going to get. I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I, I don't want to put a wet blanket on this. And I don't know how many people were really, really excited about it. But the reality of the situation is you've still got a problem at backup quarterback. Yep. Um, and since you mentioned Beathard, let me d- share the details here. Uh, C.J. Beathard sustained a groin injury while with the Jaguars in training camp in the second preseason game, which was August 17th. Yeah. So we're looking two months ago. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a medical expert. I don't play one on TV. I don't know exactly how long. Seems like seems two months for a groin injury is an awfully long time. Uh, which leads me to believe there wasn't the only reason why the Dolphins haven't brought him in until now. It wasn't like, you know, CJ, call us when you're ready and we'll bring you in. Um, okay, so and now we're le- – we're, Dolphins have three quarterbacks on the active roster. Mm-hmm. Skylar Thompson, Tim Boyle, Tyler Huntley, CJ Beth on the practice squad. Two was on IR. Two, by the way, it should be noted, officially was designated to return on Wednesday. That's the day that that happened more than likely he's going to be activated to the 53 man roster on Saturday mm-hmm. at which time I personally cannot see a scenario under which they keep four quarterbacks on the 53. My best guess is Tyler Huntley goes on IR with a, with a shoulder injury or they release Tim Boyd. Yeah, I, I think, I think Tyler goes on the uh, Hunt Snoop goes on the IR. Mike McDaniel said today that Snoop would not be available this week. And, Uh, You know, at that point, we're in week seven. You've got, you know, four other quarterbacks that, you know, I I don't think, you know, I, I, I think he goes on IR that, that, that's my guess. Um, And that uh, probably Tim Boyle, I, you know, here's what I think poop is that your best bet as the backup is the guy who has been there the longest the guy who's been there for months as opposed to weeks. That would be Skylar Thompson. We don't know if Skylar is healthy enough. I, I approached him today, and he said that I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. I actually wanted to talk to him about something different. But, um, I, you know, I, I don't know what his status is. But I do think, and I know this is not popular because of the last, you know, version of Skylar that we saw, I think you're best served with Skyler as your number two and, and then Tim Boyle as your emergency number three quarterback. But we'll see what happens there. Oh, I completely agree. And I wrote about the backup quarterback situation today on Miami Dolphins on SI.com. And one of the points I made, by, by the way, check it out. Check out all the written work on the site. There's always a lot of content. Check yeah. out Perk's stuff on SunSentinel.com as well. Why would, why would Mike McDaniel – not say Skyler had the rib injury. If Skyler's healthy, he's our he's our backup guy. He's the he's the one who won the backup quarterback competition in training camp. Why yep. cannot why should cannot and why should that not be said? As, as opposed to what Mike McDaniel, I'm sorry, Perk, yep. as opposed to what McDaniel, Mike McDaniel said, which was, let me see how practice goes this week. Mike likes to keep this competition thing this this uh competitive edge thing and i i guess that's what that is i i, I don't but i don't see i don't see you getting a competitive edge with this announcing who the backup quarterback is going to be i don't see how arizona could use that to their advantage uh but maybe they can you know who, who knows I, I don't understand why mike would not announce publicly who the backup quarterback is and I would think he's got to have a pretty good idea at this time. It's Wednesday. Uh, I, I, he's got to have a pretty good idea of who the backup quarterback is. I would just announce it. I, I don't know why he won't, but that, that that's kind of how Mike McDaniel operates. But I, I would just make the announcement and life goes on. 
Yeah, but here's the thing: if it is competitive advantage, the only competitive, the only different guy among the backups right now in terms of style is Snoop Hundley, and he's already said he's probably not playing. So right. then, if the, the Cardinals have to prepare between Skylar Thompson, Tim Boyle, C.J. Beathard, I'm I'm pretty sure, no offense, that their DC is not losing a whole lot of sleep at night. I no, mean, he's, no, he's no. preparing for Tua, and then after that, we'll deal with whoever's in there. Yeah, I would think Mike McDaniel would be losing more sleep over playing a backup than than uh, than the Arizona Cardinals than facing a backup. Yeah. So the, the again, so the other part of me is as you mentioned. I, I can't for the life of me, like if Skyler's healthy and he doesn't get the nod as a number two guy, I mean, even, I mean, we pretty much already have the stamp that the Dolphins completely messed up the backup quarterback situation in the off season. That would be the final stamp, seal the envelope, put a stamp on it and mail it out. I mean, wow. That, that would just be, that would just be, uh, Boy, I don't even know an 11 on a scale of 10. How bad did you mess up the backup quarterback situation? Just you, you just moving forward. I hope that this lets them know we can never be in a situation where we have a backup quarterback who has only been with us for weeks. He's got to have been with us for months and hopefully a couple of years. But but you, playing a guy who has only been there for weeks. When Tua tells us how difficult it is to play in this system, Boyle tells us, Snoop tells us, McDaniel pretty much tells us. So why would you think that you can go into a situation with a guy who has only been here for weeks? This is bad management. So you've got to correct that going forward. And I think the most immediate way is by using Skyler as your backup. That's the most immediate way to address this situation. And then you address it again in the offseason. But if that's the case, then they're basically shouting from the rooftops, Skyler's not good enough. At which point, to me, it, it, it's almost – to the point where if Skyler's healthy, but they go with somebody else ahead of him, whether it be Bethard or Boyle, might as well cut, cut Skyler because you're basically saying dude's not good enough. Correct. Um, to me, the bigger lesson would have been don't leave yourself with a backup who is less than ideal. Particularly, and to me, what's most egregious about this is that the Dolphins are talking all summer about Super Bowls and all that, and they spend money like they are thinking Super Bowl. And it's either they go on the cheap or – they massively overevaluate what they had with Skyler. I mean, it's just it's just bad on that. It is. And and you know, I, I just don't this is in your system and in the NFL, this is the most important position. And you know, and and quarterback, not not backup quarterback, quarterback. I don't know how you messed this up. I, I, my mind is blown. My, my mind, I just can't comprehend this. Poop, you know, I, I, I was the fool who wrote in the in, in training camp. Here are the Dolphins' top ten concerns. Backup quarterback is not on here. Neither is offensive line. I, I fell for that. I, I, I fell for the banana in the tailpipe. I know. I know. I, I just, I just couldn't comprehend that backup quarterback would be inadequate at number two and pretty much non-existent at number three when your number one guy has a tendency to be injured. I, I, this, I, I just couldn't even comprehend it. I, I just thought for sure they've got a great handle on the backup quarterback situation. I knew what we saw. Neither of those guys was that impressive. But I, I just I thought both of them could function in a game, or else why would why did you keep them for months? I, I my mind is still blown with this. No, I, yeah, me too. And I, I think it, again, I just don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's like I, I preferred Mike White, even though Skyler yep. was a little bit better in training camp, but not by much. Um, but kind of all along, I'm like, well, they they see Skyler. They've been with those two quarterbacks, you know, they, they, then they know more than we do. So logically, if they're, that's their guy, right. okay, but obviously, and then, and then we see the Seattle game and it's like, it's not that he was inaccurate or whatever. It's just, he looked overwhelmed, like out of his element. That was, 
frightening to me that that it, it was just the aura that was projected like almost like a, a true freshman making his first start at Alabama or something. That's what it looked right. like. It was just it was just bad. Uh, other two related topic here, and I wrote about this. I'm going to discuss it here a little bit. Please go read the story. I actually kind of liked it. I'm semi-proud of it. Um, All right. Changes that's going to ha- that are going to occur with two at quarterback beyond the obvious that they're probably going to be more deep shots. He's going to be more accurate. If his receiver comes open quickly off the line of scrimmage, the ball's going to get out as opposed to Tyler Huntley or Skyler or Tim Boyle, who are going to hesitate a second and then boom, the player's no longer open. Mm-hmm. Mike McDaniel's decision making game management, I would think and and would hope the aggressiveness level is going to turn up a notch. I don't know about an 11, by the way. Your amplifier goes to 11? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's broken. But yeah. <laughs> Final tap reference for those who may or may not have gotten it. Um, because there are two insanely glaring examples where McDaniel went for the field goal in situations where I'm not so sure. In fact, I'm pretty sure he doesn't go for the field goal is two as his quarterback. And this is screaming of a lack of confidence in the quarterback here in the lineup, which is also a little bit of an indictment on them. And this is the opening drive at Seattle. Mm -hmm. Fourth and one from the 39, they attempted a 57 yard field goal instead of going for it. Are we Mm -hmm. serious? And then, the situation against the Colts on Sunday where that a fourth and one from the 30. No, from what your boy line was it again? From the 36. <laughs> yeah. Down three, five minutes left, and you're kicking a 54 yard field goal to tie the game. I cannot, for the life of me, believe that McDaniel doesn't go for the first down with two as his quarterback. And this is this is going to be another big difference. And I think that's a lot healthier than going for field goal attempts there. I think Mike McDaniel's confidence level is going to increase. The whole team's confidence level is going to increase, but Mike McDaniel's confidence level as a play caller will increase. And I think we will see a big difference, as you say, right there. I'll say this, Poop, about the run game. I like seeing the run game, but I will say this again. The, The run game needs to be for balance, for the Dolphins, not mm-hmm. sustenance. You're not going to win games by running the ball. You're not built that way. And I will tell you that in the in the in the second half against Indy, they had 15 rushes. Five of them had bad outcomes. You had two lost fumbles. You failed to convert a third and one with Alec Ingold, which led to that 54-yard field goal attempt. And then on two later possessions on first down, Achan and Mostert both have minus two. So now it's second and 12 with Tim Boyle as your quarterback. You're behind the chains. So, again, you need to run the ball for balance. But, you know, 40 runs is, is just too much. It, you've produced two touchdowns in the last two weeks. You've rushed for, what, 381 yards? And you've produced two touchdowns, two lost fumbles, uh, a failed third and one. So I think that we see the run game for balance, but not for sustenance now that Tua is back. And you're smarter about taking those shots. You're taking more shots. But I think that also with Tua coming back, and I hope this is true, Poop, that we would continue to see Janu Smith as a part of the offense, a viable part of the offense, but maybe an OBJ. Maybe Odell Beckham Jr. also gets gets involved. And I don't think that this was Snoop's fault previously. Odell has had a couple of decent balls thrown his way. Uh, but but I would I, hopefully with the two deep safety look taking care of Tyreek and Jalen Waddle, that Tua and Mike McDaniel will go, all right, take some Janu, take some OBJ, take some more, take a run. Now we soften you up and we keep you guessing. And I hope that that's how McDaniel gains more confidence. And that's one of the differences we see with Tua out here. But, so, but how big of a package do you want Jenner to have? Ah, inside joke. Yes, inside joke. <laughs> inside Omar joke. Kelly jokes. Yeah. <laughs> Omar catching strays over here. Uh, before we continue our discussion, let me run down the official injury report 
for this Wednesday. I'm going to put on the old man glasses because I don't have my contact lenses on right now. So five players didn't practice on Wednesday for the Dolphins. Two of those are the obligatory, customary, usual vet rest days for Teron Armstead and Calais Campbell. Mm -hmm. Storm Duck, we saw leave the game against the Colts with an ankle injury, did not practice. Same for Tyler Huntley. We already talked about him, shoulder injury. And then Cater Co, who has a neck injury, he was not listed among the uh, press box Injuries reported to the press box on Sunday, so don't know exactly what or when this happened. Five, five players were limited. Two was limited. This is first practice back after being cleared to, to practice to get to the step of the of the return to play protocol. Uh, best guess tomorrow, barring any complications, and there's no reason to think there will be any. Tomorrow he'll be full and he'll be good to go. Uh, but today he was limited. Again, nothing unusual about this for a guy coming back from a concussion. The four other players, Lee Meikenberg, shoulders. Um, Javon Holland with the hand injury. He didn't play against the Colts, of course. Emmanuel Agba also didn't play against the Colts. Got a bicep injury. And then Jalen Waddell had a quad injury. Uh, got some treatment during the game on Sunday. Or got looked at during the game on Sunday. So this is not anything that popped out of the blue. The, the Cardinals were doing only a walkthrough today on Wednesday after their Monday night game. So their injury report, whenever it comes out, is going to be based on an estimation. The one note with them, they did lose starting outside linebacker Dennis Gardeck, who's one of their best defensive players, to a knee injury. He's going to wind up going on IR. So um, I'll, I'll say this. I, I saw – I would say almost everybody on that injury report for the Dolphins in the locker room. I saw Teron. I saw Calais. saw Cater, talked to Liam, talked to Javon Holland. Uh, saw Emmanuel Agba, um, so, I, you know, saw Tua. Actually, I, I will say this. Tua was in the locker room in great spirits. When we first walked in, he was sitting and talking to Teron Armstead and uh, Devon Achan. They, they uh, you know, when we walk in the locker room, those lockers are on our left, and Tua was sitting there laughing, big smile on his face, I dapped him up. What's up, Tua? What's up, brother? The same same greeting that he always gives. So he was in he was in great spirits. If it matters for those who care, um, yeah. My observation is two is is just fine. He was not salty. He was not uh, testy. He was not agitated. He was not any of that stuff. He was normal to a, He wasn't on the podium answering questions from us. So he was in a great mood. And right. you know, it's it's back to the old Tua. Yeah, no, he's he's jacked to play, understandably, yep. and again, he's he's gotten out of the way, you know, having to talk about the concussions, which he didn't want to do, but right. unfortunately, that kind of comes with the territory. So, territory. So uh, now everything is good. Part two of my 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 point with two as far as changes we're going to see or we should see. Again, going to refer you, please, Miami Dolphins on SI.com. Part of the same story. The Dolphins, if you remember last year, they had very poor success in short yard situations, specifically third and one and fourth and one. Mm -hmm. And their numbers were so insanely skewed toward throwing the ball in those situations. This year, would you believe me if I told you that not once on a third and one or fourth and one have the Dolphins passed the ball? That's incredible. I, I, I like hearing that. Talk about, I mean, well, the problem is, is they started off great. I mean, they converted their first four and they have, okay, how politely can I say this? They have sucked since then. And now, and maybe part of it is with Boiler Huntley, at quarterback, maybe the threat of play action pass isn't there anymore. Doesn't concern opposing defensive coordinators the way that two are being back there does which tightens up the run. And then maybe now, in addition to just having that threat there, once in a while, there'll be a, a pass call. Uh, yeah, I, you know, Poop, I think I'm almost certain maybe against Seattle, one game they converted a third and one or something like that against a nine-man front. But my point is you're right that um, without two in there, if I'm a defense, I'm like, yeah, they're not throwing on third and one. They're going for it on fourth and one. They're not throwing. Or, you know, third and one, yeah, they're probably not throwing. They're probably running. 
here's an eight man front. Here's a nine man front. We dare you to try to go deep with Skylar Thompson or Tim Boyle to, to, you know, Waddle or, or Tyreek. Like you're not going to do that. And so you're right. They're, they're highly predictable when, when you have one of those other quarterbacks out there in, in those short yarded situations. So yeah, that, that should change for the Dolphins. That should change greatly for the Dolphins. Yeah. So bottom line, the, the whole point of the, of the story and the discussion we've had here is I would expect Mike McDaniel to be to go back to being the aggressive play caller that he's been since he became head coach of the Dolphins and don't necessarily like the fact that he kind of became conservative, like uh, more like a defensive-minded coach with the backup quarterbacks in there. It doesn't speak well for – well, again, back to how the Dolphins manage that backup quarterback situation to where you have to change the way you, you approach and you attack a game. That's it's not a good look. Uh, quick other newsy note, the Hall of Fame is, I guess it's a week where they they make announcements of people moving forward in the selection process. Yesterday was a seniors, and Bob Kuchenberg advanced to the next stage. Mark Clayton and... Dick Anderson did not, unfortunately. Mm. Today was the modern era candidates and Richard Webb and Troy Vincent advanced. And then Wes Walker did not, mm. unfortunately. Um, yeah. Wow. But I, I remember asking him, asking him about just being on the preliminary list of nominees and Walker was like almost telling me, like, you know, I don't think I'm a hall of famer. No, too many other good, good players. Um, but I, I would make the argument, and this is again, if you if you go by stats, not necessarily the guys with bigger numbers, but if you go by specific roles, I don't know, find me four or five better slot receivers in NFL history. I mean, that dude's up there. He did a great job. He he yeah, you know, you talk about a a, a round peg for a round hole. That was Wes Welker going over there to New England with Tom Brady in that offense. I mean, you talk about a perfect fit. Wow. They uh, they did it well. They did it well. Speaking of honors, very quickly, I'm very excited about Tim Bowens going into the ring of honor this game. He'll be honored at halftime. Tim Bow is one of my all-time favorite Dolphins, a guy who kind of epitomizes grit and and hard work and just standing stout in the gap and, and taking on double teams and all that kind of unspoken stuff. So uh, you mentioned Richmond Webb. He's one of the guys I'm going to text tonight to try to uh, get some comments on, on, uh, on Timbo for a column that I want to write uh, later this week. But I, I just want to give a shout out to Timbo. Very happy for him. And it'll be nice to text some of those ex-Dolphins and try to get a comment from them. Uh, you know, Sam Madison, Pat Sertan, OJ McDuffie, Aronde Gadsden, uh, Jed Weaver, uh, Ed Perry, just numerous, numerous, numerous guys. I, I love those teams. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this on Sunday. Yeah. Tim Bowen's one of the most underappreciated, I yep. think, Dolphin players uh, of, of the past, I don't know, 25 years, whatever it is. Um, yeah, that dude was like a fridge in the middle of the defensive line. I want to go back to Wes Walker very quickly and a point yes. that I want to make because it's come up before. Walker started his career with the Dolphins, of course, uh, after being, I think he was claimed on waivers or signed after the Chargers cut him or whatever, but he played a couple of years here. And then the Dolphins traded him to the Patriots for a second and seventh round pick used on Sam Cincitelli, I want to say, in the second mm -hmm. round. In the seventh round, I believe it was Abraham Wright. And that's a defender from Colorado. And then I know a lot of Dolphin fans are like, think of this as the most ridiculous, worst trades the Dolphins ever made. And I want to say, number one, that with all due respect, Wes Welker is not Wes Welker if he stays with the Dolphins. Right. Um, he, he wound up going to play with Trump Brady and Peyton Manning. Uh, so that kind of helps. Number two, if you recall, Wes Welker was going to be a restricted free agent and the Patriots, by all the reports at the time, were prepared to – to sign him to an offer sheet with a poison pill that would have made it very difficult for the Dolphins to match. Um, so in retrospect, I, I, I don't I don't think it's nearly the, the 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 horrendous trade that it was portrayed. Speaking of trades and wide receivers, 
Oh, those damn Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, wow. Picking up DeAndre Hopkins from Man. the Tennessee Titans for what is it, a fourth round pick or something like that, which reminds me because now there's been a long line of wide receivers who have been traded in the past few years. And the one who fetched the biggest return from the team that traded him is Tyreek Hill. A one, a two, two fours, and a six. Yep. Plus a, new, plus a new contract. Right, right. Yep. Did yep. the Dolphins pay too much in that trade? Considering, again, the other the other price tags, and I have it here if you'd like me to list them. I, I think it, it depends on – I've said that they need to get to an AFC championship to make this era a success. If you get to a championship, Tyreek is going to be a large part of it. So in that case, it would be worth it. Boy, poop, anything less, that's a five for one deal. Anything with a new contract, anything less, I would say, no, it, it wasn't worth it. Yeah. And that's cool, a high right? bar. Yeah, no, because you look at a couple other ones. Devontae Adams, when he went from Green Bay to the Raiders, fetched a one and a two. Yep. And that's the only one. Uh, AJ Brown, AJ, bless you. AJ <laughs> Brown uh, fetched a one and a three. And what a massive difference and impact he made for the Eagles. Um, and then Stephon Diggs, when he went from Minnesota to Buffalo, he was Stephon Diggs on a seventh for a first, a fifth, a sixth, and a fourth the following year. And the big problem, again, with all of these is except for Devontae Adams, who the Raiders never won a playoff game with, mm-hmm. Bills won playoff games with Stephon Diggs, Eagles won playoff games with A.J. Brown. Dolphins are still waiting. So, um, and the flip side to that is Tyree Kill was team MVP his first two seasons with the Dolphins. Where do, do they even make the playoffs where they don't have Tyree Kill those past two years? We'll never know. Uh, Perk, you know, I don't think no, no, I don't think there's any way that they do. I, you know, me, I, I, I think that Tyreek is the man here on this team that that Tua is necessary as the guy who gets Tyreek the ball, but Tyreek is the guy who makes this offense go. He's the guy who puts the fear in fearsome offense. And so without Tyreek, you're not doing any of this stuff. Look, you needed Tyreek to get 1,700 yards each of the last two years just so you could go on the road in the playoffs and lose. I Without Tyreek getting 1,700, if Tyreek gets 1,300, if he gets 1,200, I'm not sure you even make the playoffs. That, that's what he means to this team. And speaking of trades, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out with Tyreek in a second. Speaking of trades, for those not aware, Jerome Baker stay with the Seattle Seahawks, a very short one because they're sending him to Tennessee in a linebacker for linebacker swap, Ernest Jones the fourth, and then the Seahawks are throwing in a fourth-round pick which basically tell you they're acknowledging that Jones is a better player than Baker. So um, that, that, that uh, David Long, Jerome Baker, Jordan Brooks, little circle, right? Between Seattle, the Dolphins and Tennessee. There you go. That's like musical chairs, isn't it? By the way, did you know the Dolphins last week, we had a David Long Jr. versus David Long Jr. game. This week we have an Aaron Brewer versus Aaron Brewer game. Oh, I didn't know the Brewer. I knew Long. Oh, look at you, yeah. Poop. I, yeah, look at you. I knew the I knew the Long versus Long. Nice, nice. Aaron Brewer's a long snapper for the Cardinals. Um, and I'm going to wrap it up with this because we were talking about Tyreek Hill. We began with Tyreek Hill and his level of excitement for Tua's return. And then we ended it with his trade and the value and all that. But, okay, you've talked about how excited you are. And now I don't remember the, the exact quote about, like, Strike up, the, strike up the band for like fantasy purposes. Yep. Time to do it. Uh, the talk is all great and all that. Time to do it because Tyreek's been pretty dormant since Tua was out. Well, Tua's back. Tyreek needs to be back. I agree. I agree. And 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 poop uh, along those lines. I, I hope Tyreek doesn't try to do too much. But yes, uh, Tua, uh, Tua. Need, I mean, Tyreek does need to produce. And he's he's two is going to be uh, number one on that list. Tyreek is going to be number two. They will both be under heavy scrutiny. Um, and, and by the way, I, I really like Buda Baker, the safety for, for Arizona. This, this dude is he's coming out. He's a hundred tackle guy. He's a hard hitter. And Tyreek better keep his head on a swivel. I know that he knows Buda Baker. Everybody in the league knows him. But Tyreek and Waddle. Keep an eye out for that dude because he will lay the wood on you. 
Yep, he's a player. And if you want to know more about the Cardinals, I, I encourage everyone to check out the previous episode, which would have been 388, which was the behind enemy lines with longtime NFL reporter and Cardinals reporter Howard Balzer. Yes. Check it out. Um, I think Perk, Perk gives it. Perk approves. So there you I, go. Howard is a vet, baby. He's, he's the man. He's a, he told a story about about following up how uh, Harvey Green with a with a job uh, in New York. <laughs> <laughs> or or Harvey following him. Anyway, yep. on that note, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thanks, Perk, as usual. Yep. Please like, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. And we will be back on Thursday. In the meantime, thanks for watching and have a good one.